Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Bennington Select Board's bi-monthly meeting. It's Monday, July 25th, 2016. We're convening at the luxurious Bennington Fire Facility uh, at 130 River Street. Um, we have an interesting and uh, enjoyable agenda tonight. Um, I would uh, introduce myself as Tom Jacobs, and I have the pleasure of being the chair of the Select Board at this point, but I'd like my colleagues to introduce themselves. Good evening, I'm Donald Campbell. Hello, I'm Jeannie Jenkins. Good evening, I'm Michael Keane, and as I usually say, I'm still me, hi. Uh, I never follow kids or dogs. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jim Carroll. And I'm Jean Connor. I'm Stuart Hurd, the town manager, and next to me is Linda Bermudez, our records clerk. And our esteemed, esteemed, esteemed. Records. I'm sorry. And, uh, you can see why I enjoy serving on this board with these uh, folks. They're uh, great to work with and, and share the, the time with. Um, Justin Corcoran uh, called in and that he's uh, not able to attend the meeting tonight. As we always do, we open the meeting with a Pledge of Allegiance. Jim, would you lead us? Yes, sir. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one more nation, under God, indivisible. As is our practice, we like to deal with the consent items, uh, and they've been set forth on the agenda. We have the minutes of the July 11th meeting and also the minutes of the July 20th me minute a meeting, which, as uh, my colleagues will recall, is our, was our training session for the board. Uh, I'm going to just deviate a little bit. Um, could I just get a motion for the acceptance of the minutes of the 11th and 20th. So moved. Second. Any further discussion on those? If not, uh, all in favor, signify aye. by aye. And that's a six to zero. Uh, normally, we would also include the warrants. I, uh, during that uh, meeting we had with uh, the folks from the League of Cities and Towns, we talked about warrants a bit. Um, and I'm just wondering, rather than share that long book, it comes down our way every uh, every other Monday if we couldn't pass the warrants and authorize the chair or the vice chair to sign the warrant for the board and then you don't have to worry about missing the, the it's one section or otherwise um, but in order to do that I would ask that we have a motion for that purpose um, and then discussion I move that we allow the chair or vice chair to sign all warrants as approved by the board. As approved by the board. Yep. I'll second that. Any other discussion? It just seems to make uh, some degree of sense. Is there any limitation? Limitation or liability to that? Only on the vice chair. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. I, I don't believe no, there, right. there. There is yeah. not. As, yeah. as we learned in that training yeah. session, that that uh, the chair and the and or the vice chair can be authorized to sign the warrants on behalf of the board as long as the board has seen them and approved them. I have some questions sure, about that. Um, would this preclude any board member from um, asking questions? No, not not at all. No, because it, before that author authority can come, mm -hmm. the entire board has to approve the warrants. Mm -hmm. It just means who signs for the, mm -hmm. for the But any questions, like tonight, you should ask if there are questions relative mm -hmm. to the warrants. Mm -hmm. So it, all that it is giving administrative authority to sign the warrant. Mm -hmm. Instead of all of us. I don't know. I'm not completely comfortable with that because the uh, the people of uh, the town have entrusted and put their faith in each and every one of us, mm -hmm. not just two of us, to ask relevant questions. And I understand what you what mm -hmm. you just sure. said. Sure. Um, I don't know. I don't think I need to be convinced. Um, I can only say that it's an administrative function. Mm -hmm. You, as an individual representative, still have the ultimate authority to say yay or nay to the warrant mm -hmm. and if you say nay that's going to show up on the vote mm -hmm. and it's going to be a six to one or five to two or something of that mm -hmm. nature so your vote would be registered mm -hmm. it's just that whoever has, has the authority to sign will actually sign that document mm -hmm. so. I'm not comfortable I'm just 
Okay. Being honest with you. Tom. Okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, you might want to speak at the mic. I'm not sure. I'm just not comfortable yeah. comfortable yeah. with that decision. Yeah. Other members have restiveness about it. I, I don't have restiveness about it. I, I, Jim, you know, I understand your point of view, but I think that it's incumbent on all of us to uh, read and understand and ask questions before the vote is taken. One thing that might help a little bit, if well, tell me if this would help you, we have been um, approving of the warrants with the minutes and kind of a consent agenda because it's mm -hmm. more efficient and it gives us more time right. to move on to other things. Mm -hmm. if, if you would feel better having a separate vote just on the warrants mm -hmm. uh, before the chair signs it, we could ask the chair to separate those two functions again. So we, we instead of having a consent agenda in which several, several things are lumped together, we could vote on the minutes and then we could vote on the warrants if that made uh, you feel any better about it. Well, we just like to sign. That's why. No. <laughs> No, I don't think that that is necessary, uh, uh, Donald, to have a separate vote on uh, them. My concern is that, and, and because I look over the, the warrants on a weekly basis, and, then, and you know, I, I think I've made it clear that I've had questions over time, uh, but I've either called uh, Stu or, or Dan, uh, not so, uh, less or more infrequently than in the past. Nevertheless, um, I don't have a, a quarrel with keeping them together. It's just uh, having two board members out of seven sign off. I and I, and I understand, off. I yeah. understand what, uh, what uh, the goal is, that it, it, it will, in, in point of fact, simplify things. And it won't uh, disallow any one of us board members from asking questions. Yeah. And it's no really different than, like, we're going to have a proclamation tonight. Mm -hmm. Um, the board moves on it and, and we would sign it or sometimes there's a, a note that we have to cast and the board authorizes mm -hmm. the chair to do it. It's in that same vein. It's sort of mm -hmm. administrative uh, direction charged by the board mm -hmm. for the chair and the, or the vice chair to sign it. Okay. Hey, Tom, if, if there was a warrant that one of us was not willing to approve one line that was not we were not willing to approve would we not sign the book so you would have the option jim would have the option to object to it to not sign the book now and you mm -hmm. would have the option mm -hmm. to right vote so, no against uh, the warrants so in, in the our blue book that we would get would it have a place where we object no you just wouldn't yeah. just you would vote no you would okay. vote no Rather than have five places for each of us to sign, mm -hmm. there would be potentially one, or maybe, I'm not sure how it would be set up, one yeah, place. We'd probably the look for a signature on all of the distributions, uh, accounts, warrants, and on the payroll warrants. So there'd be at least two signatures yeah. at a given meeting. Mm -hmm. Again, it's an attempt to streamline the process, but not to interfere with right. the board members. Mm -hmm. Could I call for a vote? Or unless someone else has a comment. Um, I'll call for a vote. All in favor of the motion as presented, signify by aye. Aye. Okay. All those that are opposed to it, signify by nay. The account is 5 to 1. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we also have uh, a reason to vote on the warrant because we've just had the discussion. Um, We'll use, we already have gotten that book tonight. So all those in favor of the warrant as uh, su uh, submitted, signify by aye. Aye. That looks like a six to nothing vote. Uh, we, will also, we also have a proclamation and I would ask the vice chair to uh, present it to the board for its consideration. <clears throat> the town of Bennington proclamation about the ride for Gabe. Whereas Duchenne muscular dystrophy or DMD according to Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, is the most common fatal genetic disorder diagnosed in childhood, affecting approximately one in every 3,500 live male births. And whereas there is tremendous need to raise awareness for this genetic condition that causes progressive muscle weakness, leads to serious medical problems, and premature death because it is 100% fatal with no cure currently. And whereas Michael Staley, Wes Bates, and Payne Griffin are riding their bicycles from Houlton, Maine to Mobile, Alabama, a trek called the Ride for Gabe to bring the needed awareness to DMD by telling the story of Gabe Griffin, 
an 11-year-old Alabamian who suffers from this debilitating condition. And whereas we are honored as the town of Bennington to welcome and recognize these cyclists and the Hope for Gabe Foundation who are engaged in such a worthy cause, and whereas it is boys like Gabe Griffin from Alabama who show us what real courage and strength are, inspiring all of us as they show the world they're not afraid of challenges along the way as they fight valiantly to overcome obstacles and roadblocks that are presented to them by Duchenne. And whereas raising awareness about DMD, that is Duchenne muscular dystrophy, will lead to more support and hopefully a cure in our lifetime, now therefore, we the Bennington Select Board do hereby proclaim Sunday, July 31, 2016, as Bride for Gabe Day to end Duchenne in the town of Bennington. And we invite all citizens to join with us as we bring awareness to Duchenne muscular dystrophy and as we support these cyclists in their journey across the country to help and honor Gabe Griffin and other patients suffering from Duchenne, dated at Bennington, Vermont, this 25th day of July, 2016, by the select board, town of Bennington, Vermont. You've heard the vice chair uh, read the proclamation. Um, do I have a motion to accept the proclamation? As presented? So moved. Second. Second. We have second. a, we have a second. Um, any further discussion relative to the proclamation? That's a long bike ride. It is a long bike ride for a, you know, if you think of one in every 35 male lives being affected, that by itself is uh, a statement of, of how uh, difficult this particular disability is. Uh, hearing uh, the proclamation, all in favor signify by aye. 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 That is six in favor, and we will all sign the proclamation, and the town manager will see that it's presented to the riders as they come through on Sunday. <clears throat> we now have a, a citizen's comment period. Uh, this is an opportunity for citizens just to be recognized, to come up to the, the lectern, uh, introduce themselves, and state the reason they would like to share their thoughts with us. Um, go ahead, Michael. Uh, I am a resident of Dorset, and I work here in down in Bennington. Could, could you maybe move that mic or a couple of mics? I'm not sure what, how. Sort of up towards you. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Better? Okay, All right. Um, so I'm, the reason I'm here, I'm on something of a quest to uh, encourage the State uh, Agency of Transportation to consider raising the speed limit on US Route 7, uh, the limited access portion of the highway between roughly exit two and the railroad crossing in East Dorset. Um, as a daily commuter on that road, uh, I've found that the, uh, in my commuting in the last couple of years, I found that the speed limits under good conditions is a little bit oppressive, and I, I believe that my fellow commuters agree with me because the, uh, the typical speed on the road is about 65 miles an hour. Um, engineers generally set the speed limits on roads at what's known as the 85th percentile speed, and I believe that that's roughly where the, the speed is on that road. So. Uh, I, I have a feeling that the, the lower speed limit of 55 uh, causes um, uh, some negative uh, in, impacts such as, um, well, inconvenience, but also per perhaps uh, contributing to road rage. Also, there might be a safety concern, whereas uh, while most people do go about 65, you do get the occasional driver who complies with the law and goes 55, and uh, what you have is more passing than might ordinarily be the case if the tr if the traffic were flowing at a uniform rate. So anyway, um, what I, you know, as, as I, this uh, this need kind of uh, built up, I I reached out to a uh, to a community group. Um, you're probably familiar with the Manchester Marketplace Facebook group, uh, which has about 8,000 members. So I posted a poll back in April on that group. Uh, gauging the, the public's uh, feeling about this issue. And I got roughly an 85% uh, positive response rate. Out of about 210 respondents, 31 thought it would not be a good idea to adjust the speed limit. So uh, based on, on those findings, what I did was I started a petition 
uh, being that it's a state uh, jurisdiction, a state road, I, uh, uh, I started a petition uh, which I submitted with the, um, to Chris Cole, the uh, Secretary of Transportation of the state. Um, and I have, uh, this I have a copy of the petition here with me uh, with 243 signatures on it as of right now. Um, and I got correspondence back from the state basically saying that uh, while it is a state road, they don't really have a mechanism for responding to such, uh, to such input. And they uh, are looking for more local buy-in. The municipalities that are affected by, uh, by the traffic rules on, on that road, uh, they, they want to, I, I guess they don't want to step on the feet of the municipal governments. So they've kind of kicked this back to me and asked me to, uh, to approach the local governments and ask for some local buy-in in, in the form of uh, a written request, basically, from each, well, from as many of the municipalities uh, in the North and South Shire who are uh, interested in pursuing this. So that's why I'm here. I've been before the Manchester, Dorset, Sunderland, and Shaftesbury Select Boards in the last couple of weeks, and I plan to go to Arlington after here and be done with this. <laughs> but um, I, I, I feel like um, it's, it's something that uh, you know, do, does have good public support. Uh, I, I think it would benefit us uh, quality of life-wise. It might also encourage uh, more tourists to pass through the area rather than if they're heading to Killington or some other resort area. Uh, with a slightly higher speed limit, this, this route might be more attractive than perhaps going through Fort Ann and Whitehall. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of good reasons to have a look at this. Um, what I'm asking from the state specifically is that they uh, initiate a study to, to determine whether this can safely be done, whether, uh, you know, I'm not an engineer, I don't, I don't know, there may be reasons why it's just not doable, but um, I'd like the state to take a look at it. So uh, with your permission, I'd like to give you a copy of uh, the petition along with uh, there's uh, a, a several dozen comments from people who signed the petition that uh, you can peruse, and also my correspondence with the state that's basically uh, outlining what it is that they're looking for from the local governments. Would you like to make that part of the record tonight? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, uh, for, yeah, uh, I'm just asking the question just now. Uh, would you like to make that part of your record uh, tonight? Of the minutes of the minutes? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Um, if I have no objection, we'll make that a part of the, the record. Good. You can just give that to the town manager. And then we'll entertain questions from uh, the select board. Really? Anybody? No. During? Okay. Yeah, it's a citizen's I, comment, but, I, you know, just if we have some inquiry. May I? Yeah, but I want to do this is brief. Mr. Keene. Yes, uh, Mr. Keene. Could you, do you know what the traffic the numbers are in terms of traffic up and down, let's say, Route 7 from Dorset to Bennington uh, each day. Uh, I what don't have that. What the peaks would be, what the, lows would, what the lows would be, for example. I, I don't have that, uh, that yeah. information. I'm I, you know, I don't want to get into uh, an agenda, and I understand that. Uh, so if it, and this is the first time we've heard about this, because I haven't heard any burning uh, issues presented by the local uh, folks, and again, I think the state has ultimate jurisdiction over sure. this, and I'm kind of concerned that they, all of a sudden it's passing it to the, quote, municipalities to deal with, because uh, I think it, the buck really belongs with them, because I think we have limited interest in this on a community basis. Um, but that's a personal observation, and um, while I certainly would defer to I think I think the in generally in, in state highways located within municipal boundaries, if the select board sees a need to either raise or lower a speed limit, we would simply request a speed warrant analysis mm -hmm. for that section of the roadway which is within the town of Bennington, and forward that to the agency of transportation. But I didn't get that. Was the, the impression I got was uh, further up? Was it? Was it? Uh, where was it? Was it exit two. So um, the. Communities that uh, where this section, I, I believe Bennington, there's a few miles, uh, Shaftesbury, uh, Glastonbury, which doesn't really have a town government, right. uh, Arlington, Sunderland, uh, and Dorset are the uh, affected communities. I have some so, observations. Yeah. 
it, it would I think the request is to simply increase the speed limit from 55 to 65 as you pass exit 2 heading north and that's, coming and that's south, you would reduce it that's back correct. to 55. And that's in our town? Yes, that it was in the town of Bennington. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Did I hear you say it's just requesting a study to be done? Yes, basically I'm, I'm, I'm asking the state to, to, uh, to do a study to find out if it's safely feasible mm -hmm. to raise the speed limit. And of course, if the study determines that yes it is, then hopefully the state would take the initiative then to take the next step and do that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not an expert in this either. I'm from New Jersey, so I, I am as well. have a little bit of a heavy foot. <laughs> um, I'm wondering, I, we'll have to see how the study goes. I'm wondering if it's because there's no median <clears throat> and it's a two-lane road. That It could be. I don't again, know. I don't think we should get into a yeah. discussion. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an engineering question exactly. that, that the yeah. state yeah. warrant analysis will determine. I think we'd have to put this on the agenda and you're yeah. going to have a question for yeah. a, a discussion whether or not we even want to ask for, recommend, or have yeah. any discussion on that and uh, having your comments. But if you'd like I to just want to yeah. offer a little bit of uh, historical perspective and personal uh, perspective on Route 7, which I drive just about every single day. Um, but 55 miles an hour, historically, was suggested and signed into law by Richard Nixon because they found that that was the most fuel-efficient use of uh, cars at that time mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, you know, make people uh, car mileage better. Nevertheless, uh, having uh, traveling uh, Route 7 north and south every single day, I go five miles over the speed limit. And as a friend of mine, oh, I better not say that I'm, I'm having second thoughts, but uh, instead of the, sure. uh, the uh, rather rude salute, it's just partial. It's a partial salute over the uh, speed limit. And my point is, if you rate, and, and uh, traveling every day, people fly by me, and I know they're not going 55, they're going 65, even 70. So if we raise it to 65, you don't think that people are going to be pushing it to 75 or even 80? There, there certainly may be a, a tendency in that direction, but because um, of the, the police certainly. officers and state troopers that mm -hmm. I speak with, and I've spoken with a lot of them, I'll say, you know, what's what's the barometer? What's mm -hmm. the threshold? That's not yeah. within which you'll yeah. stop them, <laughs> and they'll say it's about 10 miles over. I, okay. I agree with you, and that's yeah. the, basically what happens in practice. Yeah. Um, at the same time, enforcement is. A separate issue, mm -hmm. and I, I kind of wonder why we why we treat speed limits this way. You know, the the drinking age is 21. Mm -hmm. it, the, you know, one day before it doesn't. You know, no good. Uh, so I'm I'm not quite sure why there's this kind right. of unwritten I understand. understanding. And uh, my uh, point, my point, mm -hmm. and then I'll finish up on this with uh, with you, Tom. Is that we raise it to 65, and people are going to be going 75. Okay. The, well, again, the, you know, thanks for the, your, the, the police are certainly yeah. within their rights to enforce yeah. the speed limit. At, Might be know. a revenue generator. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate okay. the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Mary, then Sam, then we have some folks. Hello, everyone. My name is Mary Garish. I live on Pleasant Street in Bennington which is why I came to talk with you tonight. Um, I want to preface my remarks by saying that I personally, and I think many other people, appreciate the efforts of the town in holding the Pleasant Street block party that's upcoming this Saturday. I'd like to give a little historical perspective, however, on how that idea came about. Part of it was through the survey. Um, I'm just thinking maybe this is really an agenda because we're, that's coming up, and then let Michael do it, and then you can give a historical perspective. Okay, I'd rather, oh, it's going okay, to be on the agenda. So, it's actually on the agenda. I, okay, so should I, I have a couple other comments. Should I save those also? I don't. Yeah, yeah. let's do it. No, if you've got comments that aren't related to the block party. No, they are related yeah, to the block party. Yeah, Excuse me. Yeah. please, okay. Okay, Stand. all right, fine. Thank you very much, Mary. We we'll look forward to in a few minutes. Sam. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sam Rustino from Bennington. How are you doing? Good. 
Ironically, I have a question or a statement about speed limits. Uh, this past month, this past Friday, Bennington dodged a bullet on the south side of town at 4.30 in the afternoon. I believe that was July uh, 8th. A head-on collision by Park Lawn Cemetery. That speed limit is 30 miles per hour. Does the town of Bennington still have that possession of a visual speed limit sign? If they do, I'm making a request that they have that visual speed limit sign at Park Lawn Cemetery and leave it there. The gentleman that was driving that vehicle was out of state. I don't know if it was weather related or not, but technically that sign that flashes in an amber color, he would have saw that speed limit sign and possibly slowed down. There have been other gentlemen, uh, I don't know what his name is, I'm surprised he's not here to speak about the speed limit sign or speed limit issue. He, Stu should know I'm preaching to the choir about the speed limit sign being reduced. I think we, we need to not hear another bullet and, and look at it, that speed limit sign. My second thing is Battle Day weekend. That's our heritage. Bennington Battle Day. I'm fearful that we're going to be losing the image of Battle Day. There's not much involvement with our fire department anymore from what I see and hear. Activities, people coming into town. You look at bringing people to reason why to come to this town. Can we have one year to bring the drum and bugle competition back to this town? Is it that difficult to bring four bands to sit there? We've all been there before on Spinelli Field on a Saturday night, the day before the battle day, charge admission and generate some revenue so that we can have funding for the battle day weekend. Because I'm fearful that if we don't do anything, fire department, uh, young firemen, why, why do I want to bring my family here at Bennington? There's nothing to do for the weekend. I, I think we need to reinvent Battle Day weekend, and our fire department needs help from the select board. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. I, I, Battle Day weekend is the fire department's weekend. All of the activities, all of the participants in the parade, all of the bands that come to town are hired essentially by the Bennington Fire Department. Uh, and the volunteers within the department that perform the activities. So, um, and I, once again, this year will be the annual state convention. I think you'll see a ton of firefighters and their families in this community on Battle Day weekend. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, going to what Jim says, historically, I remember the drum and bugle corps, they were fun to watch and, and it they, became, that was in the old days when it became very came. very expensive exactly. e e even to even to have the few that march yeah. in the parade yeah. is a tremendous expense yeah. well the, I, historically there was a competition and yeah. i remember as a, a young boy a young adolescent they were spine ting tingling yeah. uh, shows yeah. but they, as you said they were very expensive and they they haven't gotten any cheaper. No. And you know, I've spoken with uh, different fire officials. And Sam, it's a great idea. You want to jump in and, and help get it or Huh? Okay. Because really that's where this thing falls apart is enough people to help organize it and uh, uh, organize the, the competition and the monies that would go, uh, the prizes that were awarded historically. Isn't that true? Stu? Let the record show. I'm here on camera and in, in person. I'll be more than happy to roll up my sleeves and help out. Right. I'm not going anywhere. I'm 53 years old. I'm here till I die. I'm ready to work. Well, Stu, who okay. is uh, in charge of uh, organizing the... Yeah, why don't we do that off? Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would you like to come up? Thanks. <laughs> Or she's the speaker, or are you both? <laughs> you gonna both speak? Yes. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. For our purposes, could you just identify yourself? And I know you're not residents permanently of Bennington, but you're, we have the privilege of having you in our town for about a year. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, I'm Nevin Lassard. I'm an AmeriCorps VISTA in Bennington for about 11 more days. Uh, I've been here since this past August in 2015. Um, I'm Rory Price. Sorry. 
And I'm the AmeriCorps Vista at Southwestern Vermont Healthcare. Um, I also started in August and have, have about a couple weeks left. Um, so we're here to talk about Youth Appreciation Day. Can you yes. tell us what AmeriCorps Vista is, is as an organization? Yes, um, so AmeriCorps Vista, it's a national service organization um, all over the country and people like us and every other age and background come to a community, work there for a year with some type of organization um, and basically work on various projects that are focused on alleviating poverty in a specific region. Um, and so we have three AmeriCorps Vistas working this year here in Bennington. Next year, I believe there will be five here. So uh, there's a, a strong, strong presence in the community here. Uh, so yeah, we're here to talk about Youth Appreciation Day, which if you're unaware, that paper in front of you is a quick overview of when it started and uh, what it is now. So you can see it originally started back in 2013. Uh, based on the youth risk behavior survey data that it comes out of the high schools every two years. And the data that prompted this event to be created was that only 38% of high school students here at Mount Anthony felt like they mattered to the community, uh, which is shockingly low. And it has gone up slightly since 2013 when that data came out. In 2015, it was 40% but that was the fourth worst in the state of all school districts, school supervisory unions. So we're still kind of at the bottom of the barrel right now. And so it was developed from the Career uh, Development Center. Um, one of the classes there worked with Kaya Morris to develop this resolution, which was passed by the town locally, as well as at the state level for a Youth Appreciation Day. And so in the coming years, uh, the first actual event was in 2014, uh, a celebration at Willow Park, and it has evolved. Um, and our most recent one we had this just this past year in May. Uh, and so this is the third year of an actual event uh, at Willow Park. Um, and let's see, that? yeah, so um, it's a community event. If you aren't aware. Uh, focus is on youth, Youth, youth Appreciation Day, um, basically to celebrate the youth in, in the community, show them that they're cared about and that they matter to Bennington. Um, and it's free for the day. Kids can come with their families, free food, free activities, free games, free music, raffles all day, um, and basically just a way to celebrate them. Um, What's the date of your event? I don't see it on here. Um, it changes year to year. Um, this past year, it was May 7th, which was a Saturday. And um, as you can see on there, in this uh, most recent year, Governor Shumlin passed uh, the proclamation or whatever, the proclamation for Youth Appreciation Month statewide, which is now May. Uh, so going forward, chances are the event will still be held on some weekend day in May. Great, so just to touch on the benefits of Youth Appreciation Day really quickly. Um, we had a big part in planning it, the three of us. Um, Michelle Morocco is a VISTA at the Regional Commission, so she was also helping. Um, and we were the sole ones to sort of pull it all together. Um, so we think that it benefits kids and families because they get a day to sort of just enjoy themselves regardless of their so socioeconomic status. Um, they can just go play in a park. Um, we know that stress levels in children and adults are very high, so if we can take that down just a little notch one day a year, we're really happy to do that. Um, families get to explore and enjoy Willow Park, which they might not totally be aware of um, the rest of the year, all the, the wonderful things that that, that has to offer. Um, and it's also a really very visible event that helps um, to show that the town cares about the area's children. So we have big bounce houses, things like that, that are very just highly visible and apparent that the town is really supportive of the youth. Um, and that helps to foster trust between, between leadership and the residents. Um, benefit, uh, benefits for the businesses. Uh, the businesses could participate in performances. Uh, we had little Zumba demos, things like that. Businesses can staff tables. Um, and they also donated a lot of raffle items. Uh, the town let us use the parking grounds at Willow Park picked up trash and offered day of support, which we're, we're really very thankful of. We wanted that to make sure that went on the record. Um, 
And outside of what it's been so far, which has been about 250 to 300 people in attendance, we really think that it's a great opportunity um, to sort of be a culmination event for all the great area um, youth programming that takes place. And we hope that eventually it could have a broader reach and pull in folks from the surrounding area as well as older age groups. Um, so we're here talking to you today because we had a few struggles getting it all pulled together because it was just the three of us organizing it. Our two biggest obstacles were funding and organization. So we spent a lot of time begging and borrowing. Everything was donation and grant based. Um, so it was, it was difficult for us to, to provide what we really wanted to for the children. Um, and then organization, we just spent a lot of time sort of pinning people down, repeating efforts that have been done in previous years. So routinizing some of the basic aspects like booking the park, moving tables from the chamber, that kind of thing would be really highly beneficial. So what we're looking for is more community partners which could assist with one or both of those issues, the funding and the organization. So potential partners could include ACT, um, the United Way, UCS, uh, SVMC, the SVSU, and then also maybe the town. Um, maybe Project Catalyst, the rec center could have a larger presence. Um, so we're here talking to today, today as VISTAs, and like Nevin said, there will be five next year. So this isn't something that we're trying to push off on you for, for next May, but we're really just trying to sort of plant the seed that VISTAs won't always be in Bennington. We are here for a year, um, and it sort of goes in cycles. So it's not a guaranteed thing to have a VISTA presence every year, and we're just really afraid that once VISTAs aren't in Bennington, there won't be a Youth Appreciation Day, and that would be a real shame. Um, so we're hoping the event can continue to grow and that you can help us do that. Uh, Great. Thank you. Um, I, I didn't go this year, but last year I went to the uh, event. It was, it looks like a, it was a good day. You know, the kids were having a great time. The uh, barbecue was fun. Um, everybody had more than enough to eat. And I did uh, get the feeling that the people were coming and going during the course of the day, so that we weren't locked in. Uh, how many folks did you say? families were participating this year? About 300 individuals, wow. we think. That's good. And I noticed the presence of the hospital being a significant uh, sponsor and mm -hmm. underwriter, uh, the town as well. Uh, and I expect that probably you've got the seed already planted, I'm hoping, but it's certainly appropriate for the record to indicate uh, so that we don't lose this, what appears to be something that the community, especially the youth, look forward to. At least that's my impression. Other comments, reactions? Go ahead. Was there any partnership with the rec center? Did you do anything with them or did they in any way work with you? Um, they, we booked Willow Park through them. I did ask for sports equipment and they offered like one basketball and one soccer ball okay. um, and so they didn't have anything else available so maybe that could be something that could change in the future. Um, hmm. Anything right. would be helpful honestly. Good point. You'd like to broaden it, make it more active, right? Correct. Go ahead, Jane. Did you want to say something? Go ahead. Well, I, if, this yeah. is one of my pet peeves yeah. with all the organizations. I read your list yeah. of donating organizations and businesses, and I don't find the town of Bennington on there. And it happens quite a bit when we loan out our facilities. We don't charge for that, and we provide cleanup, and we provide all of those services. We should at least be listed. That's Sorry. not necessarily only you guys. It happens with a lot of organizations. We always, they accept that the town does this, but we never get the recognition. And that's pet peeve number one for me. Right, and I mean, well, we, we definitely appreciated having that space being offered up to us um, upon request. It's uh, a drop in the bucket, we kind of feel, towards what the whole day is. Um, I mean, it's, it's an awesome space, but We'd love to have the town really be involved going forward uh, since essentially if we go away, the, the event drops dead. And so just having a town presence at the table from the get-go, um, I think is a huge help. And it kind of would open doors that we don't necessarily have available to us right now. I have something to say. Or Jeannie, please. Let's get down. I'm really happy that you're here. I really think this is important that you're bringing it to us. This is a community responsibility. And I think it's wonderful that we have energetic individuals who are willing to put a lot of energy into it. But 
as you've said, you change every year, so it's the learning curve starts at zero every year for the next AmeriCorvistas coming in. So I, you know, I do, um, I hope that there is an opportunity to start planning early. I know that has, that has uh, impacted the ability to do what we wanted to do with, with this. And, you know, I think there's a clear, there's, there's clear need for more recognition of, of just how much this community depends on each other and how much we value youth. And there's obviously a clear connection to economic development, but there's also just a sense of, you know, who we are as we grow up. So I, um, I do hope that you will keep this on the radar. And uh, I, is there someone, uh, will Michelle be able to get kick this off in the fall before she leaves and get the new AmeriCorps on board and, and then get us all moving on this? Right, so Michelle doesn't end her term next month. She'll end in November. So there will definitely be a little bit of overlap. I'm also staying in the area for one more year, so I'll be able to assist with planning. Okay. Um, I thank you very much. Mike. Yeah, I, I, I really, like Jeannie, I want to thank you. I, I think you should also make yourself, uh, make yourselves a pain in the butt to us and remind us very frequently that this is a town event. I'd like to ask you just briefly to tell me what you would advise, doing what you've done and knowing what you know, what would you advise your successors from America? in terms of this event yeah, what specific? Yeah, what, what three things would you tell them? Um, specifically to this would be to get people at the table early. Um, having worked briefly with the Project Catalyst on this block party that's coming up, they had everyone they needed to from day one and things got rolling right away and people were divvied up with tasks. So we just didn't have that. We're here, we don't know who anyone is. We're trying to figure out how we even book the park. Just so, I mean, if the town is at the table from day one, then they can just say, yes, you can use Willow Park so we don't have to mm -hmm. be spending a month just trying to book something so simple. Uh, that's the biggest thing that I can see. I agree, yeah. Getting started planning earlier, um, maybe involving more local businesses would be good. Um, I think it would serve as a benefit to them as well as to, as well as to the event. Um, and we really, we had really hoped that the event would be bigger this year with more people in attendance. Um, and it was sort of a function of we were spending so much time doing things like raising money to make sure that we would have food to provide and things like that, that we didn't have the time to dedicate to marketing and really making it, you know, delivering on what we were trying to promise. So um, any assistance with, with the planning would definitely be Thank you. Um, in your earlier remarks, you know, you, it sounded like to me that it was, it was sort of a lament from you that uh, not as many businesses have stepped up to uh, participate. Does that sound accurate? I mean, they've been willing to, as you can see on the list, there are 20 <coughs> that donated more. and 15 that were there the day. Uh -huh. But in terms of actually planning the event, uh -huh. that's where, I mean, everyone is happy to say, here's a little thing to raffle off, or yeah, we'll show up on the day and set up a table. Uh -huh. But who wants to be there from day one to plan it? And that's the, that's the real hurdle that we have to get over is people that are willing to come to a meeting on day one and stick through it for a couple months to make sure that the day goes off without a hitch. You know, uh, that's a common complaint. You know, people's lives are pretty circumscribed. Uh, nevertheless, um, I know it's difficult, you know, to go hat in hand and ask for help. Um, and it's best to go with somebody to hold your hand through it. And uh, I certainly would be happy to uh, jump in. Uh, you can contact me through the, the town office for good or ill, whether or not it helps or it doesn't. Um, but nevertheless, I applaud your efforts and the, your youth and doing and jumping in so early. Um, it's it's going to be uh, gratifying to see where you are in 20 years when you're old and gray like me. Okay. Thank you. I have just a real boilerplate question. What's the definition of youth? Is it all the way down to kindergarten? Is it is it a broad definition? Yeah, I mean, in terms of this day, we're not going to exclude anyone really. Okay. Um, it's totally open to the public. Okay. Um, in the past, the majority of student or youth that arrive at the event are probably elementary school aged, um, but we'd love to get a, a greater high school and middle school presence. Um, and whether that's actually at Willow Park during the day or whether it's 
some other type of thing that may be is more attractive to a high school student than spending the day at the park. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that we're looking to explore in the future. So it's kind of all inclusive. Okay. Uh, I also, I have, I, my, my mind's just spinning with ideas, which I'm not going to take up today, but I also am very willing to at least sit down and talk to you about the ideas that I have. I, I plan a lot of events professionally, so my mind's just going crazy. This is a pretty effective presentation, right? With ideas. Um, and I, I, I want to strongly encourage you to collaborate with other organizations. It is a prescription for success because you, aut you automatically have buy-in. So if you can find a couple organizations to collaborate with would be great and I leave copious notes for your successors because you're not physically going to be here yeah. we have a lot yeah. of debrief ideas right you know just <laughs> give them as much information things you did wrong things you did right so they have a running start yep and you need a champion or a co-champion and that's I think what you're you're saying okay I think uh, unless you have something else uh, we really appreciate your coming in and sharing your you. experiences and uh, good luck in your life's travels Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your efforts. Mary? You be another Good evening. Go. I'm Mary Morrissey. Thank I'll you. only take a couple of minutes of your time. I'm seeing that we're about a half hour into your 15 minute public <laughs> um, comments. Um, I'm here to ask the board to reconvene the Renewable Energy Working Group. The BCRC this past Thursday, under the chairmanship of Dan Monks, approved the changes that were made to the town plan in regards to the siting of um, renewable energy here in Bennington, especially with the solar. Under the recent um, information that has come forth that Sun Edison has filed bankruptcy, some of the very solar companies within our state have been under their umbrella or connected in some way or shape. My concern going forward is, and you've heard me at this very mic a number of times asking about decommissioning. We had spoken earlier on about decommissioning the clear cutting issues, but at the time only did the portion that we did to change the town plan going forward. We were promised by Chairman Jacobs that this group would get back together to possibly reinstitute or to institute several more pieces to our changes. Um, I think that is appropriate at this time, as I said, being that Sun Edison has, fi bank has filed bankruptcy. We're not totally sure of what those connections or, or possible problems may be. The decommissioning would be very important because if you have a company that's filed bankruptcy and there really isn't a plan, and as you've heard, most of the plans that have come before this select board, virtually none has had a real decommissioning plan to go along with their proposal. That should concern this board, being that I don't think at the end of 20 or 25 years you're going to want to have solar graveyards across the state with no means of, of putting them to rest or however that would be. Um, also, so at this point, I am looking to ask that that will happen. And, um, you know, with the working group, I know Jim Carroll would have been here tonight. He was part of that. Don Campbell was, Jim Carroll was, Dan Monks, and um, John McFadden right. was, but I'm sure there could be a replacement made I, there. I, I think I'm going to volunteer the vice chair. It's a good position to, okay. uh, to have as part of that dynamic process because it is a dynamic discussion. Um, what we talk about in the town plan is just that. It's a plan. Um, now things are coming back at us faster and faster, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you see what can happen to a mega uh, developer uh, can go into bankruptcy, and who gets left holding that uh, bag? And, and well, and that's, that's my that's my concern. Yeah. That's why I'm so before. Why don't we reconvene that uh, <clears throat> committee uh, at a time that works for Dan and the committee, and uh, then report out within a, a time that we can talk about. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it does make sense to, you know, this is something we should be looking at 
frequently, not just every five years. I appreciate your time. I, I, I just want to say that uh, what, what Mary Morrissey has been talking about is the, uh, the bankruptcy of Sun Edison, which is an international developer of solar arrays. You might want to take that without sounding an alarmist tone as a little bit of a canary in a coal mine. Um, because I believe, according to the stories in Vermont Digger, it's leaving the, uh, the new Fane school system with a sort of a $300,000 hole and an expectation of a solar array that was to be used at a school. So I think we just need to proceed carefully with all of these negotiations that happen and need to remember that this business that is called the solar business is probably moving way faster than the speed at which we are accustomed to work, also moving faster downhill as well as uphill. Sorry. No, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. And thank you for appointing me. Uh, uh, I'm happy to serve. I, I didn't even ask. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm ready. your present. OK, now we go into the agenda items. Um, we'll be talking about uh, the, the block, upcoming block party, uh, which is exciting. It's a, really a part of something that's been in the works, uh, sort of a culmination of, of where you're at right now, right, Mike? Uh, but it, it's sort of like the frosting on that cake that you've created. So let me give you a, a little bit of background. Um, I did uh, connect with Mary uh, just before. Uh, we started the meeting tonight and she did voice some concerns, so I want to give her an opportunity to share those concerns, but um, we're also going to see if we can, can work with her to, to make sure we uh, resolve some of those. So to give you some background, uh, the work that Project Catalyst has been doing started on Pleasant Street about a year and a half ago. Uh, during that time, we did resident survey, uh, and in the resident survey, the residents identified a block party as one of the things that they would like to see to help build community on the street. Uh, from that point, we have uh, went through the winter and moved into the spring, uh, where we were then had an opportunity to begin to plan uh, such an event. Uh, at the table, we've had um, not just the town, the Vermont Department of Health, the Bennington Chamber, the Coalition for the Homeless, uh, UCS. Uh, we, there have been times where we've had some residents of Pleasant Street uh, sit at the table as well. Uh, we have gotten some feedback from people uh, on the street. Um, so I think we've tried to take everything into consideration. Certainly, if, if there are concerns, we'll try to answer those. Um, but we're looking at an event uh, this Saturday, uh, July 30th, from noon to 2, uh, looking to provide your typical uh, hamburgers, hot dogs, veggie burgers, some healthy uh, food options along with that um, and uh, and then we reached out to different organizations around town um, I through Stu uh, and others have uh, sent out a letter that went out to many of the major organizations in town asking them you know would they like to be a partner in this event or activity um, to be able to provide some activities for youth along Pleasant Street so we do have things like uh, face painting uh, jump rope hopscotch um, uh, there's going to be uh, a llama and a mini pony. Uh, there'll be, uh, I just found out today um, that there's the potential that um, uh, Hemmings will have their popcorn cart there. Uh, we have uh, Gamers Grotto is going to do uh, a little Wii uh, game where they project uh, on a large screen and let uh, kids play uh, the Wii uh, uh, video game that they have. So again, there's a lot of different activities going on. What we're looking to do, and, and uh, I recognize this isn't necessarily ideal for residents on the street, but we're looking to uh, block off uh, School Street to Park Street. And the reason we identified that was, one, the municipal parking lot was right there. There's a significant amount of green space, but two, it meant we could shut down a street and really have no impact on through traffic, uh, especially uh, in a residential neighborhood where people need to come and go for a number of different reasons um, again it it's not it's it's a little bit removed from where most of the residents are and I know that's one of uh, Mary's concerns that she's going to share but some of it was uh, simply logistical uh, in nature the 
we've had donations the town is uh, supporting obviously uh, through some funding but we've had also commitments from uh, the health center as well as a local landlord um, that's contributed funds as well to help uh, purchase food and we're looking at police fire and EMS all wanted to be a part of it so they're uh, looking to cook the food and serve the food and we're hoping that you know there'll be some trucks and cars out that um, you know we can just have on display and stuff that'll be family friendly so that gives you a little bit of background again there's the event poster um, but the food is free there'll be uh, music games um, and again it's about two hours uh, for just the event I should say one of the things um, that we did look at doing was uh, We've been trying to do different neighborhood cleanups around that area. When ACT had their retreat, uh, they looked to do a neighborhood cleanup around the Ben L School, the block around Ben L, but we got uh, torrential downpour uh, at the same time, so we put that on hold. Um, so we were hoping that we could maybe incorporate it into this activity. So for those that want to participate, there is going to be at 1.30 a quick little neighborhood cleanup where everybody can get a small trash bag, fill it up. If they bring it back, they get a free ice cream cone. Uh, we'll Cox Dairy donated the ice cream. Um, so there's a bunch of different things going on, um, but I know uh, I'll answer any questions that the board has, but I also want to give time to Mary to share. Mary also wanted to speak to it. Yeah. Why don't we just, Mary, if you could just uh, sure. raise those and we can have the discussion. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Mary. So as I said, I want to preface this by saying I think it's wonderful. Uh, that the town is so involved and so many people are so involved in the block party. I'm, I'm happy to know my, that there were people from Pleasant Street in, in on planning this because I certainly wasn't aware of this and I don't know anybody on the street that was. So that was going to be one of my first suggestions for the next time. Um, we got, uh, the historical perspective is that we had a great neighborhood meeting um, and Mike was there and Kaya Morris was there. And there, were, there, was a, there was talk about people who were new to the neighborhood saying, like, I'm afraid to walk down the street. And there were other people, such as myself, saying, what are you kidding? There's, I mean, we all know that there have been drug busts on Pleasant Street, okay? Um, there have been drug busts in other parts of town, too. <laughs> um, so, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean it's a dangerous neighborhood. And in fact, I was telling stories about some of my neighbors and how helpful they've been to me and other folks without even being asked. So we decided that a good thing would be for us to all get to know each other. And hearkening back to the survey where some people wrote it in and the discussion that happened there, a lot of folks, and I'm, I'm old enough to remember block parties when I was little, it was like the most fun thing all summer, right? Close off the street, everybody's out there with their tables and cooking and sharing food and playing music or whatever they're doing. The kids are all running around playing. So this sounded like a really good thing. The other thing is that because um, Pleasant Street is economically depressed and because there are a lot of addiction issues in economically depressed areas, lots of folks in my neighborhood feel kind of excluded for various reasons from Bennington as a whole. They also, a lot of times, would rather be invisible and not call attention to themselves. So the idea was that a block party would kind of make everybody come out and it wasn't like you have to go somewhere, it's like it's coming to you. So when we got the notice on our door a few weeks ago, saying 12 to 2 p.m. Pleasant Street in front of Thatcher House, I went, huh? <laughs> because nobody lives in that block except for the people at the shelter who aren't actually going to permanently live there. And then it says, free food, family-friendly activities and music. That sounds good. Neighborhood meet and greet. That sounds good, but it's not really in the neighborhood. Um, it says the street will be closed to vehicle traffic. Please bring chairs if you require seating. Now, I don't know if anybody knows how far it is from like the horseshoe end of Pleasant Street up to Thatcher House, but carrying chairs is probably not practical. It also says, plan to use your own private bathroom facilities. None will be available. So that didn't sound awfully welcoming either. Um, 
it also says no substances, no alcohol, no tobacco, no pets, please. I get that, okay? I, okay, I'll, I'll admit it right on television. I'm stupid and I smoke cigarettes, <laughs> but I do not get the smoke near children. So if I were at a block party and I wanted to smoke a cigarette, I would walk away from where other people were. But that, but I would still be at the block party and able to come and go. So I was, I was talking to Mike about these concerns because I've been to a couple events over the weekend where I've encountered lots of folks from Pleasant Street who are like, well, I'm not going all the way up there. I can't even use the bathroom. And, and you know, I don't know, what, what is this all about anyway? And then the article in the paper said there was, and Matt was, or Mike was just, I'm so sorry. Mike was just talking about um, the green up thing, which is great because the other thing we talked about was, why don't we use that time to make, some, let's put some flower boxes on Pleasant Street, okay? And let's all plant them. And let's make it look really nice. And let's become a community and a neighborhood. And that's what this was all about. So I was a little disappointed to hear that people weren't coming and to hear that some of the sentiment was, um, and again, this is not meant to be you know, unappreciative for anything that's being done. But some of the sentiment was that it's folks who think the Pleasant Street folks need to know what they need to do to become a community, telling them how to do that in a place that isn't exactly their own backyard. And then it might become a self-fulfilling prophecy because if all, a lot of other people are invited too. I don't know if anybody knows it, but a lot of churches send out the word, everybody come, you know. And of course, I mean, the more the merrier, but <laughs> that doesn't make it a neighborhood block party. And so the idea is that if the people from Pleasant Street itself don't show up in full force, then it's going to reinforce this awful stereotype that people have about Pleasant Street. Where See, they didn't even come to this nice block party that the town put on for them. So Mike was, is also, I shared my concerns with him. And he understands that. And I understand the logistics of closing off the street further down and people not being able to come and go. That's a rough one. We are going to have a meeting tomorrow morning to try and figure out how to get the word out. Because, for example, St. Peter's Church decided, since they are on the block, that our bathrooms are going to be open and we are going to put tables and chairs outside and we're having all kinds of games for the kids and that sort of thing. But there's no way to get people to know this between now and then. So that's what we're going to meet about to try and figure out how we can get out the word. And I just, I just wanted to present that perspective so that if by chance there aren't a lot of people from Pleasant Street there, people don't say, see, a block party doesn't work. Because I think it could work, and I, I know that everyone here wants it to work. I want it to work. The people on Pleasant Street want it to work. It's just a matter of refining the process. So mm -hmm. thank you for listening. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. thank you. So I'll answer questions or um, concerns that the board has. I think in, in talking with Mary, and we'll certainly talk more tomorrow morning, um, you know, some of it is what can we do between now and, and Saturday? Some of the logistical pieces, um, you know, if if the one big thing that is preventing people from attending are bathrooms, um, you know, then we'll try to find a solution to that but, uh, with working with the church, but also if we need to bring in porta potties, that's an, an, a relatively easy fix um, with the time that we have. Uh, I think the location piece, you know, we can be a little flexible, but again, having something up in a residential neighborhood where you're blocking traffic so people can't get out of their own driveways, that becomes a little more uh, of an issue. Um, you know, I, I think also, too, when you have um, uh, organizations trying to sponsor the event as opposed to um, individuals, there's other considerations you have to take into place. Like we, we did talk about having community and organizations provide food, but we also recognize that that's a risk um, when you can't have control over where the food come from, how it's prepared, what ingredients are used, how it's been stored. Um, so we also tried to minimize some, some risk on that. And so uh, in that, I think we're gonna try to um, 
work with Mary and see what we can resolve between now and Friday. Um, but it sounds like, you know, the community members that are, are participating are excited about it. I think there was a mixed message early on when the paper covered it, um, where it came across like the entire community was invited. Uh, so, uh, you know, I want to clarify that this really is a, a block party for uh, the residents of the street. Um, and, uh, and the letter did go out to organizations because we needed them to, one, be aware as a property owner on the street, but two, we wanted them to participate. So, um, you know, we'll try to curb some of that and, and have a conversation tomorrow about how best to do that. But I'll answer any questions that the board has. Sure. We're going to keep the questions short yeah. because I think the proof is going to be the postmortem. Yeah. Absolutely. And how effective it was. And so next year can yep. get the second annual. Um, um, but. Board members, if you do have a thought question, but have in mind that this is something that's already planned, let's not redo the plan. I, I should say too that we did, um, so we did some benchmarking as well. So we did talk with um, uh, Brattleboro, we talked with Rutland, they had both done block parties. So um, we tried to pick up best practices from those other work. Uh, and first responders are gonna be helping out, right? Yeah, so they'll be, again, but they'll be in polos and shorts yep. and no, serving food, so. Um, Where are you getting your volunteers from? Is it first responders? So primarily? some of the volunteers are coming from those that have been involved early on, so the organizations. Um, we're certainly open to volunteers. I think in the letter that went out, um, it did ask, uh, you know, if you want to be an active participant, certainly let us know. We'll tell you the best way to, to go about doing that, um, you know, whether it's, so if there are some organizations that have said they're going to bring volunteers. Well, I have no doubt the two of you will come up yeah. with some great ideas, but um, hopefully the weather will cooperate. That would yes. be great. <laughs> yeah. And I was just thinking to, to get over some people's uncomfortableness about coming out, it's really good to give them a job, something mm -hmm. they have to do, even if it's something really simple. Sure. Sometimes that really helps people just yeah. take that step and they have a responsibility to go. Yeah. That's it. So I that's a good idea. Um, Mike, I applaud your efforts. I mean, I think this is a great thing. Thanks, and you sir. know what? Everybody that's sitting around this table knows that um, no matter how hard we try or don't try, we've made an effort. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be some ankle biters. I love that phrase, Mr. Keene. <laughs> um, we're never going to be satisfied now. with the, uh, the uh, level of effort that, that we make. So for those who would say that you know, uh, playing Monday morning or Friday or Saturday morning, uh, Sunday morning, quarterbacking on this. You're making an effort. I appreciate and I applaud that. it. Absolutely. Thank you. And and I should say the the board, the entire board's welcome to to come. Um, you know, I, again, I. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> part of part of what I think. So there's there's two components going on here. Um, By the way, you had me at mini pony. <laughs> see, uh, uh, we'll we'll get a saddle up and ready to go. Um, uh, but the one of the components too, I think, and I think Mary can appreciate this too, is breaking down some of that stigma that th that Pleasant Street is its own little community that we don't want to interact with. So I'm hoping we can bridge that gap as well. Because to be honest, one of the things that incre that impressed me about Pleasant Street was that if you took those individuals and put them on any other street, it's exactly the type of neighborhood you want because people will walk out of one house, walk across the street, sit on the porch of someone else's house. They'll sit there and chat. They know everybody by their first name. Um, and I saw that from the times, uh, you know, I've walked up and down the street and, and met with people. So, um, you know, from the, from the people that you want on the street, the, it's a really close knit community. So hopefully we can engage them over the next couple of days. Um, the only other, Jeannie, did you have a... Well, go ahead. No, go ahead. Just I had a no, final... No, I, I think it's really reinforcing what you just said and also what Mary said, and I really appreciate you saying this. I, I do... I think um, the, the second year effort hopefully will involve the community from the get-go mm -hmm. so that people don't feel like something's being done to them as opposed to yep. it growing organically. And I, I think that's a... It, it's, a yep. it's always a concern yep. when people come in yeah. to a community, it doesn't then feel like it's yours. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's great feedback. I think there's those, and Mary's one of them, those people that really call Pleasant Street their home and have lived there for a long time. Um, but then you also have this significant transient population there too. Um, 
that probably half won't be there by the time next year rolls around. So um, that's a whole other challenge. The only other comment I was going to make was um, one of the things we did launch with this, because this is part of Project Catalyst, which is a much larger effort, is that we did um, launch a website. It's a pretty preliminary site, but it's meant to at least give the information. So I just wanted to give a preview of that. Um, you know, here it just gives the opportunity for people to learn about what's going on uh, and some different um, different pieces of information, who our community partners are. Um, it links in social media, it has a calendar option, it has a blog option. Um, so there's a couple different opportunities here for us to, um, to interact with the community. Uh, and then um, it also gives people the opportunity to uh, participate uh, through uh, contacting us. So who's, um, this, who's this designed for? Uh, in all honesty, it's right now it's really meant for anybody from general public to business, so it's community-wide, um, and this is based off of some of the stuff that they've done in Rutland and some other communities, but it gives people an opportunity to at least um, become part of the Project Catalyst effort. Um, and that's on the town website? It's, so this is its own separate link, website, I, but it's, sure linked, it's linked to through the town website. Yep. Yep. That so, was a during a battle day parade, by the mm -hmm. way. So those are three, three locals. Yeah. Mike and, and Mary, uh, if I understood you correctly, there are people from, let's say, the far east end of Pleasant Street who will need to go a block, a block and a half to get them. Is there some way we could just sort of get some sort of a ride to get them down? Yeah, that's a, that's a thought. Too. I mean, mm -hmm. you know. That we can think about that because it is, I mean, it's not a long length. I like to walk, so no. it's not a long way for me. Mm -hmm. Or if you're bringing a chair, or, or if you're older. Or yeah. Whatever. No. Yeah. It, it is long, and it, it is long if they think they have to go back home. <coughs> exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, yep. we got to get that word out there. Yeah, so I think that's all good feedback. Good. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, that's it. Are you looking at other areas to do in the neighborhood? Yes. So I think, um, great comment, the original concept, um, because resources are limited uh, and, uh, and that it has been a challenge as we move forward, but I think um, certainly identifying kind of these uh, different uh, areas where we'd love to put different resources in, but each area is different. So if we were to pick another street or another neighborhood, what they need is going to be different than what we're doing on Pleasant Street. So, you know, Pleasant Street needed a lot of infrastructure upgrades, lighting, sidewalk, curb, street, um, paving. So um, there's a, it was a very different need. Um, but yes. Thanks, Mike. Let's go right into yep. the uh, maintenance ordinance. Yep. If we could get up to it. So uh, one of the other components um, on the agenda was the uh, property maintenance ordinance. What you have in front of you is pretty much the, um, uh, the version that was uh, at the last time presented, there was only one suggestion, but it wasn't um, decided on wholly by the board, um, but it was on page two under um, section four, uh, jurisdiction, uh, and there was a comment made about considering uh, owner-occupied versus non-owner-occupied. Um, so I made the note of that, um, but if there are other comments, this is also an opportunity for the public to speak yeah. as well. I think it's important that we emphasize that this is the first cut mm -hmm. of, a, of a maintenance ordinance for our community, which we've never really had before. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about a very focused area, mm -hmm. uh, basically the central business area. Uh, we're not trying to make this across the, the entire community. Uh, and also within that area, we're trying to focus on basically unoccupied vacant properties. Yeah, well, and, and I should yeah. just point yeah. out, it, it is town-wide, yeah, but, but, um, but it is very specific on right. commercial, yeah. not necessarily residential, right. yeah. unless we're talking uh, multi-unit dwellings right. or rentals. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Anybody have uh, questions, comments, concerns? You want, because this is the, an opportunity to, uh, to share those. Um, this is the first reading. Um, next uh, time we'll come back but uh, it looks like a good effort 
I'm Jim, just oh, going to say what I said the last time we were talking about this. People in this room uh, and outside this room have worked on this for a long time, reviewed it with uh, realtors, reviewed it with property owners, reviewed it with uh, town council, and uh, I, I like this first reading. I hope we can, I hope we can dispatch it fairly quickly mm -hmm. next time. The only comment I was going to make, Jim, was I just wanted you to know that um, your comment was noted, even though the revised date didn't change because we didn't formally change it yet, but on page two under subsection or section four under jurisdiction, I did up at the top there, I did make that note between owner-occupied versus non-owner-occupied. So it just needs to be a decision that the board makes, but I did capture that note. Thank you. I'm just, I think we got to, we'll come back to you, Mary. I just want to make sure the board gets the comments. Go ahead. Uh, uh. I had to read this a couple of times and I still, still don't quite know if I have it right, but I, I, I think you just straightened me out. So okay. it's all buildings yep. in Bennington, but it's yep. vacant properties in the central business district. It's all vacant properties across but town. But the jurisdiction is over all buildings. All buildings. In Bennington. The all jurisdiction buildings. is only over vacant buildings or uh, commercial buildings. So the only difference is if you're living in your home, uh, if it's a single family home or if it's an owner occupied duplex, um, then you're exempt from the maintenance requirements. But if it's a vacant building, uh, if it's a commercial building, industrial building, um, then it is under the purview of this ordinance. And I think so I, this would, just to uh, play it out, this would include, for example, barns, um, sheds, other things that, pertinent structures that would go along with. So I'd ask for Dan just in terms of definition, in terms of commercial buildings, um, things like barns and structures like that. But this, no, no, it's, it's spelled out, it's public buildings means any public building. Um, yeah. it's, as the uh, proposed ordinance says. It's defined by the State of Vermont Building Code, but excluding single family and two family rentals. That's building. But then the other part of this goes to the property, means any property, parcel of real estate on which a public building or vacant prop building is located, inclusive of all buildings and other improvements thereon, and any vacant parcel of real estate located in the central business district. So that, I don't think it's conflicting uh, because a building is a building, a, some property is, whether it's vacant or otherwise. And wouldn't yeah. public necessarily in, imply that it's used by people? Accepting single family. Mm -hmm. But yep. a barn yep. would not necessarily be no. used. No, yeah, that's, I don't know, how, that's how I would see it, but no, no. I mean, to, 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 to make it as clear as you possibly can, all vacant buildings are subject to the maintenance requirements, whether it's single family, two family, commercial, okay? Um, in order to be subject to the, um, however, uh, single family and two family owner occupied and rental buildings are not subject to the, to the, uh, to the Wait a minute, ordinance. rental buildings? Single family and two family. Okay, but yeah. other, the, other well, commercial, but other multi-units multi are. are. Okay. Yep. So try to make it as, yeah. you know, there was some squeamishness on the part of property owners and some mm -hmm. on this board that, you know, if you're going to go after single and two family, it should only be if it's vacant. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we did. Mm -hmm. But that's two or three word change if you want to put them back in. That's easy. It's not, it's not difficult. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's where we drew the line based on the mm -hmm. feedback we got from the community and from you folks. Obviously, it was not a consensus at that time. There were just concerns mentioned. So that's where, that's where we left it. Have you got any uh, calls, comments from the public directed to you on the ordinance? Not on the ordinance per se. I will say, sorry, Kevin's not here because he'll tell you, hmm. a good many of his calls that come in are people complaining about conditions of property nearby. Um, mm -hmm. Most of them are vacant buildings, so it's, no matter what, they're going to be covered by this ordinance. There are 
a very small percentage, maybe one or two that I can think of, where actually somebody's living in those one or two family buildings where they would not, this ordinance wouldn't reach that. But I can tell you that probably 95% or more of the buildings we have trouble with, uh, when it comes to single family and two family, are vacant. Uh, so we, this ordinance will give us a tool we can use for probably 95% plus of those single family and two family structures. Have you anticipated any problems with lenders, uh, both either local or uh, out of the area? Uh, anticipating problems with who? I'm sorry, I missed it. Because it's, lenders. You know, vac you know it's, it's vacant, uh, uh, you know. Well, as you know, <laughs> yeah. that's a tough one because yeah. oftentimes these properties are in limbo or technically they're still owned by the debtor, but the debtor has abandoned Gone. the property because right. they know that they're going to be foreclosed upon at some point. Um, right now, our only way to force compliance based on state statute is to, to put liens on those properties. Um, and obviously, that's very complicated with the foreclosure process and what liens are extinguished by that right. process. So yeah. it's, it's a tough one. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we haven't, discussing it with council multiple times, we haven't been able to find a way around that tricky issue. So. Okay. Other time to hear from the public. Mary. I have a quick question. Um, the vacant, it's vacant buildings, but what about, there's at least one place right in the central business district mm -hmm. where there, But there's nothing there. There's nothing there. Yeah. Does that have to be vacant? It does. It does include vacant land too. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Just within the district. Yeah. Right. Right in the breakdown. And identify for the audience the central business district, the how, uh, where that is. Sure. Uh, it it's actually much smaller than people realize. Yeah. Uh, it is predominantly Main Street, um, and uh, uh, maybe. Yeah, so it's it's smaller than um, the designated downtown. It's smaller than the um, the design review district, uh, which I just learned when we were doing um, the other incentives program. It's a very small section of right in the downtown. Runs from Depot to is it Silver or Valentine? Dan, <laughs> uh, Valentine. Okay. Um, and again, this is our first effort, and I'd rather see something that has teeth and can be enforced with relative ease, meaning not having to hire five new assistant yeah. uh, zoning and building administrators. Yeah. And then uh, see how it goes from there. Uh, and if it looks like we're getting the bang for the buck, fine. Um, otherwise, we'll re revisit, revisit this. Great. I, I need to work a little bit more on it in my head. Uh, yep. I also would like to go back to the minutes of that meeting because I, I feel like I remember it differently than, uh, than maybe it played out. And I apologize for not having time to call you about it this, That's this right. week. But, uh, what do you it's vague that? enough in my mind that I can't really draw it all back. Uh, but but I, I thought, for example, on the public building thing, my memory is that that was more a conversation about if you have a resident in the building, not whether it's a single or two-family rental, but if it was... If, if it's owner-occupied, you owner-occupied, I thought was the phrase that we were kicking around. It is, and, and I did, that was the one I made a note of, but the board didn't come to a decision on that. So um, it's just I made a quick note in the version you so got. So are you in G? Two. Are you in 30? Uh, I was actually on page G? two. I just noted it in one place, but it would have to be it's under, under G and then under jurisdiction <laughs> up at the top there, Donald. I see. The last sentence. Um, so there's that little piece. But I think moving forward, when we when we have our final version that the board wants to approve, you know, we can either have um, single family and owner occupied, or we could have single family, two family, and owner occupied. So there are a couple different options there on, on how broad you want to get. Usually, and I think um, where we went with the two family is that the definition of multi-unit dwelling is three or more. So that's why we identified single and two family. Mm -hmm. um, but then Jim brought up the, the point about uh, owner occupied. So I think we should clarify that for sure. Uh, it's just a question. Right mm -hmm. And yeah. three, three or more so, is a public building, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So. Yeah. So that's why we had multi-units or three or more. Um, so if the board, is that what the board wants to put in and identify, uh, specifically identify owner occupied? Well, I, I, go ahead. I don't think. As, as buildings that would be exempt, I should say. Okay. So owner occupied, single family. Well, even, even that, I, I don't think that, you know, in fairness, that the point that I, that I made in our past uh, several meetings about this was that, you know, if people are making honest effort, mm -hmm. effort and, you know, they're financially strapped or whatever, you know, we shouldn't be coming after them with, you know, hammer and tongs. Um, but if, then again, if people are just being belligerent, and it, it, it's apparent that they have the means to maintain their prop, property in a, in a proper way, then, you know, and that's the conundrum that I see between, you know, falling down or uh, uh, adopting this. So you're feeling that we would be better off not to, and, and I could be persuaded on this point too, not to have exemptions at all, but to leave it to the most, enforcement to the kind of most egregious cases? I wouldn't argue with you on that. You know, if there are people that are really making an honest effort and for whatever financial reasons or financial constraints, they can't do it. Um, uh, it sounds arbitrary. And I suppose there is an element of uh, arbitrary, uh, of it being arbitrary. Um, but the slippery slope on it is, you know, who makes the decision? If I could, I think that you're worried about a minuscule percentage. Okay. We're talking about the, okay. the, the properties we have trouble with when it comes to single family and two family, regardless of their owner occupied or rental, are the ones that are vacant. Mm -hmm. We yep. have almost no problems with, with owner occupied mm -hmm. or least, you know, tenant occupied, one and two family structures. So, you know, we have no personal opinion about which way you want to do it, but it's. It, it, I'm telling you, we don't have a significant problem with those types of properties, so they don't really need to be in here for those one or two properties that we may be able to think of over the past five years where there's actually been an issue with someone who's lived in their home, living in their home, or, or a tenant who's living in a single or two-family structure where there's really been a problem with, with maintenance. Not to say it doesn't happen, but we can usually... Usually there's other issues going on there. Like health and safety code. Well, junk on health the, safety. Junk, junk outside, you know, problems with maintenance of the structure where it's become unsafe, uh, you know, those sorts of things. We can usually, there's usually other things that are going on there where we're going to be dealing with that property. So th those are, it's a minuscule portion of our problems. If you want to include them, fine, but I don't think it's anything to spend a lot of time worrying about. So it's up to you folks. Okay. okay. Sure. What about the vegetation? Where would you go into that situation? Yeah. Uh, in the most. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, so great question. Um, so, we had, there were some major concerns about. You know, identifying a specific length of grass, um, but really what we talked about was um, vegetation overgrowth. Um, so there is some discretion there, uh, but I think the the idea was those extreme cases, um, you know, where it's clearly unmaintained, um, where someone really hasn't spent any time trying to maintain either the front of their building or a vacant lot or something like that. I think one of the original. Um form templates that we got there was a height there was issue a number, and, yeah. and that became really not particularly helpful like, uh, yeah. uh, we're not going but to I think have, we're looking for those people who are very um it's again, obvious uh, I mean, extreme cases yeah. where it's uh, com yeah. very clearly unmaintained yeah. so it's not going to be deemed as arbitrary but it's obvious yeah. in the eyes of the whole well and i i mean i don't you know our that's typically because of the size of our department you know, the most extreme cases are the ones that we we go after or if uh, someone registers a complaint. Hypothetically, if we pass this, um, how many, uh, this is just a you know, high-low, uh, properties in this area would you suggest would be subject to some remediation? All of them or the ones that would probably... Number-wise. We, we take an active... Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I mean, there are, clearly in my mind, there are 10 that I could come up with. Okay. Um, you know, where there's a very clear violation, and you know, in talking with Kevin about how he uh, approaches that, it's, um, it's never uh, simply visiting the structure and handing out a violation. So there's a, there's a remediate, you know, identification of the, of the issue and a, re a remediation period. Um, and then once, even when the violations um, uh, provided, there's a remediation period after that as well. So there are multiple times where someone has the ability to correct the, the issue. Would there be an opportunity to kind of give a property owner a heads up that things aren't looking good and? T well, typically, and I don't want to speak for Kevin, but if a property is identified, the first thing he actually does is, um, you know, he'll drive by the property and simply send a note. Okay, great. Um, so he it's sends not... a letter that just says, you know, this was what I witnessed or identified. Uh, but here's... this wouldn't be implemented. Yeah. And no, yeah. Yet. We very, very rarely begin formal enforcement process and even more rarely actually go to court. So most people, once they realize that we're serious, they take care of the problem and sometimes it takes a little time and effort, but usually we don't have to go to court. So. He also, um, I know Kevin does make direct phone calls as well. Okay. Um, let's uh, revisit two weeks hence to possibly um, respond to, but in the interim, I think if any, members of the board or public have questions or concerns, direct them, direct them to. Yep, uh, we I'll can address receive them. all of those and, and this is up on the yep. web so yep. people do have access to this document. Okay, good. So I'm yeah. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are we going to the tax Pro rate? Property tax rates. Yep. Uh, yes. Um, that time of year when we, we set the tax rates for the uh, general fund, the highway fund, and the Bennington Fire Department, uh, we are proposing tax rates of 63.19 cents for the general fund, the highway fund at 37.72 cents, and the fire department or fire fund at 7.84 cents. It's important to note that the general fund is up approximately four cents. However, the highway fund is down uh, a penny and the fire department fund is down about four tenths of a penny. The total increase is 2.44 cents or 2.2 percent. Uh, we had projected back at budget time, uh, if everything had held, that we would be looking at a two and a half cent increase. So we're slightly below that. Uh, and um, that brings the total for those within the former village limits. Now this would not, this would change for those who live in the rural fire district because their tax rate is slightly different. Um, and of course in North Bennington and the village of Old Bennington, they have their own general fund tax rate as well. Uh, we're looking at a total tax rate of $1.8.75 uh, per hundred. Uh, and given the recent decrease in the education tax rate this year, which is a first. Uh, the actual increase for a, a property uh, with that tax rate will be about four tenths of a cent uh, over last year, practically level funded. And I think that should be good news to all of us. Yeah. When's the last time you had that uh, kind of a report? A level funded almost. A, a uh, town and school. We're probably going back somewhere 20 years yeah. Yeah. where we've seen that. Uh, education tax rates have, have constantly yeah. outpaced the towns, but nonetheless, e even we've always been in the two to three cent range ultimately. Uh, last year we did have a big jump at five cents because we were, uh, at the time we set the rate, we, we knew we weren't going to get some revenues we had counted on, and you folks wanted yeah. to fund the highway fund. At its, at its budgeted amount. Right. So I would be looking for a motion to set the general fund, highway fund, and fire department tax rates as proposed. I will entertain such a motion. Uh, so so we, got, okay, we got a second and a third. Um, we do have a, actually a motion and a second. Um, is there any further discussion, questions that you'd like to focus or direct to the board? I think uh, this, all the effort 
uh, certainly is, uh, you should be congratulated in the management side of things to keep it at that level. Well, um, I, I, and, you, I mean, yeah. obviously you folks yeah. do the work on the budget, so yeah. you too should be congratulated. Well, we're looking for that too. <laughs> um, but uh, all in favor of the tax rate as uh, offered, motion made, signified by aye. aye. There's six in favor, no opposition. Great. Thank you very much. Good uh, work, Stuart. The next is the borrowing, and this, these purchases were all approved during the budget process. We are, we are allowed to combine them uh, in a borrowing through uh, People's United Bank. Uh, it's for a, an F-350 <coughs> truck for a gator that will be shared between the police and recreation departments uh, for maintenance of uh, some of our new park lands and for enforcement there as well. Uh, and a uh, large mower uh, that will be used by the Recreation Department. Uh, it is a total of uh, $64,160, the borrowing. Uh, we would need a motion to waive the reading of the resolution. Uh, and I have for you, should that be approved, uh, the note itself, which requires your signatures, even though there aren't enough lines, please squeeze in. Um, and then the resolution itself requires your signatures, and then the NARN arbitrage certificate also requires your signatures. So there'll be three I documents. Move that we waive the second. reading of the resolution. Second. Okay, all in favor of waiving? Aye. Aye. That's Aye. Okay, then now to the uh, motion to uh, accept the borrowing. So moved. Second. second. Um, Again, as Stu said, this was uh, done at budget time. It's not anything new. Maybe for the new members it would be, but we, this was discussed and presented by the various departments uh, when we convened back in uh, January. Um, and the, the rate is very attractive. 2.15, 2. Yes. I think it is. Uh, yeah, 2.15. Um, and that's with the People's uh, Bank. That, it's about 16000 a year over a four-year period. Yeah. Very, very attractive. Um, all in favor of the, or any, excuse me, any more discussion? Uh, having none, uh, anybody, would we all vote uh, for, in fa signify by aye. aye. That's six in favor and no oppositions. Thank you. Stu, do you have a report? Uh, I don't have a manager report and there are any action items. I should note, though, that um, uh, I think last time we talked about the fact that we agreed to take the lead on getting a letter out to all of the potentially impacted property owners uh, regarding the PFOA situation where the water lines would possibly pass their properties. I'm, I'm happy to note that uh, we mailed, uh, I think it's 439 letters today uh, with a return postage postcard. Uh, and I'm very hopeful that the people who receive these will actually respond because this will give us a true idea of the interest in, of people uh, we have, a, of that 439, I think 278 wells that have been contaminated above the 20 uh, parts per trillion. Uh, there are some that are lower. Uh, some of these folks may already be on municipal <coughs> water, but because of the way the, the system is configured, uh, we had to uh, notify everyone uh, where these water lines will be extended or expanded. Is the, where's the testing? Uh, we did get the report from the state, but where do you think the final, where they uh, last well? Uh, the indication is, is that uh, folks along the Chapel Road south uh, towards North Branch Street, uh, there have been some fines, uh, some hits there of above 20 parts per trillion. Uh, fortunately, we can also serve that area should we need to. Uh, I don't have numbers on what the estimate uh, increase in cost would be to do that uh, uh, and those folks um, uh, I believe they're going to be receiving a letter because we know that they're there even though they some of those folks may not yet have been notified testing continues uh -huh. uh, and uh, so if you are in an area that's impacted you haven't had your well tested the contact information for the state of Vermont is still out there they're still active and they're still pursuing it is the area of interest, the, the latest area of interest on their website also? So for people um, who want to know. I don't know that the maps have changed because 
They generally don't change the maps until all of the property owners have been notified and the test results received. So there may be some lag time there, but we know that it's, it's in the Chapel Road area as well. But the, the beauty of it is, is the, 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 the amount of PFOA being found is slowly decreasing. Dropping off, good. So we're hoping that we're finding the outer limits. Great. That's the, thank you, that's okay. it. Um, other business, I'll just go right from, oops, I guess I better go the other way. Donald. No other sense. business for me tonight. Okay. I have to do two things. Three. Number one, I, I want to thank Stu and the Vermont League of Cities and Towns for arranging and having the, uh, the training session for the members of the select board and also members of the Stamford select board and Shaftesbury select boards who joined us the other day uh, in, this, in this very, and, and North Bennington, in this very room uh, with good deep introductions on in terms of the, the open meeting, the open meeting law, uh, in terms of what happens when a select board operates in a quasi-judicial matter and uh, ethical questions that come up. It was a pretty full day for all of us, but it was, I think, to have everybody around the table hearing the same thing at the same time. The second thing I wanted to mention is as we, as we are very grateful for the group of investors that is targeting the Greenberg property um, and, 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 and are confident that that will go forward and go forward well. I think it, it may be useful to remember that that is sort of the, the, the trigger event in a, what should be a bigger view of this town going forward. And we as citizens and as select board members need to be thinking about what's the entire picture uh, of which the Greenberg property renovation and renewal would be a component. Uh, what, do we, what do we want this town to be 10 years hence? What is our vision? I think that's partially incumbent upon members of the select board and uh, town management to figure that out and propose it to people. But we're, we could start on a right track. We just cannot forget that there is a bigger picture. And I, one of my sports heroes is Wayne Gretzky. And I love what Wayne, Wayne Gretzky says because he says, I don't, I don't skate to where the puck is. I skate to where the puck is going to be. And I think part of our challenge as a town is to figure out for us, where is that puck gonna be in 10 years and, and aim ourselves for that. Sorry for the long. No, no, I, I think that's why we have these uh, other business discussions. So, because I th going, staying with your thought, um, you know, the Greenberg block, block is uh, critical, but it's really a start. And if we just sit back and say, well, go ahead, developers, we're all behind you and we'll support you, that we're not doing our job. I think we, as a select board and the leaders of the community, I think the community expects more of us that you know it's more than just the downtown tax district it's more than the the this part that we discussed tonight we have to have a, a community vision and i believe that we need a an agenda to discuss that and how we want to if we want to uh, proceed with it because if we just think the greenberg block is going to do it well we're not going to be either doing our job and i think the community is going to be uh, it's going to be a disservice to our community let's look look forward. A um, couple of other uh, things too. I, I do think as part of this discussion, um, and maybe we'll fit into it, I think we need a, a, an agenda where we talk about our charter and what we, how we want to look at a charter that hasn't been really looked at for a number of years now. Um, so we as the leaders start to look at how we see that charter fitting into the that plan and that vision that we hope to, to establish. Uh, that, you know, there's a lot of heavy lifting when you look at the, those things. That's not something that the first uh, review is going to result in a, in a, a change in our, our governance. Uh, but that is, is part of, well, I think, that, that vision process that Michael is, is uh, talking about. Uh, and the other area that is of concern to me and it sort of touches on our maintenance ordinance. But, you know, as I look around and I've talked with management about, management about this, 
some of these extended uh, stay facilities that are operating in this community are really doing a disservice to the folks that happen to reside in those places. Uh, and it's a, it's a big nut, but frankly, uh, some of these uh, places are not fit to house individuals that stay there, not just on Other extended stay. Uh, where someone would stay, uh, not on a, you know, passing through or a motel stay where they actually live uh, in okay. motels. Uh -huh. And we've got a mm -hmm. number of them that are, I think are of questionable um, maintenance, questionable operation, and uh, not a, a, a service to the folks that stay there. Um, and it's not fair to the community or to the state to continue to throw money in these facilities when uh, these families are put in living conditions that are not acceptable. It's a big mm -hmm. issue, but frankly, I think we have to start to identify that it is an issue. Um, and if we're trying to deal with uh, poverty and other areas, mm -hmm. we just, just can't, can't just look the other way. When you have a motel, it seems by definition, um, where the school bus comes by every day during the school year and picks up the children who live there, mm -hmm. there's something wrong with that. Uh, are they not subject to the same health code law? There are, I, we'll talk about it as agenda because, as an agenda item, because as I understand, there's some limitations with that basically by statute and by ordinance. So this is a, a bigger issue, but I think the discussion needs to be uh, pursued. Enough, enough tonight. But we've got a busy school year coming up. I've got just one thing. Go ahead, Jim. Um, uh, you know, you're talking about uh, local leaders, not just ourselves around this table. And I want to congratulate uh, Polly Vanderland for <laughs> of Summer Sonatina for her third flash mob uh, in the downtown. And uh, Polly uh, posted something on Facebook, and I've actually seen it in other places where uh, the crosswalks have been painted to resemble the keyboard of a piano. And, pardon me? I've seen it, yeah, and there are other places around the world that have done it. And I thought, wow, that's a great idea. And Polly took it one step further. And that is, especially at the four corner, you know, in four different places on either side, no matter which way you're heading, you could use those, where's Matt uh, Arrington? Matt, you listening? Mm -hmm. Paying attention, come up here. Um, you could potentially use that as billboard space to one, promote businesses and or upcoming events. And uh, I just, Tom and I were talking about this. Stu's not so enthusiastic about <laughs> it. But, um, I we tend were, to be a realist, but well, <laughs> that's all right. Everybody, you, you ought to be a dreamer. Come to my house. Anyway, um, I think there would be an opportunity for Greg Van Houten, our former uh, select board chair to create banners that with a little of epoxy or a glue could be applied to the streets and you know over time removed and you know this may be an opportunity for not only the uh, chamber but the BBC to generate a little extra income uh, and promote our businesses I think it would be terribly unique and uh, could change over time Um, I just have two quick things. Several of us attended the select board slash school board meeting this past week, and I really liked the direction. And I don't know, it just it, we were diving a little bit deeper into the issues, and I think it was a, a really productive use of our time. And I think it's going to continue to be. I think the the sense I got was that there's interest in. And maybe this has always been going on, and I wasn't aware of it, but it seemed like we were going to dive deeper into one topic per meeting instead of sort of floating along um, on the top of topics, and that was really good. And this is something I thought of as I was listening to the presentation on Youth Appreciation Day. Has the select board ever had a student representative like they do on the school board? I just thought that might be something that the select about? board could do for a high school student that's interested in getting into town government. We did that a few years ago and no takers. Okay, there you go. But it doesn't mean we can't try it yeah. again. I don't know, I'm just throwing it out there. Have we ever had an intern within the uh, management? Within we, the we've had a number of interns over the years uh, in various departments. 
depending on the need and, and on the program. Uh, we ask that interns uh, help design their program and that it have outcomes that can be measured. Uh, most of our, our interns are uh, college students who are uh, looking, looking to gain some knowledge of government and how it, how it functions. So we have done that a number of times in the past. Um, and uh, I was maybe, thinking more just along the lines of a high school student. Yeah, there's but, a kid out there. Yeah. I did it with Bob Madison when I was uh. a kid. So there's some other dork like me, um, or nerdy, poly, uh, you know, little poly, political wonk out there who wants to. Wants just something to, do to think about. Yeah. Something we could offer. That's there's a, a kid out there who wants to do. Got a lot of. When school resumes, we've got a lot to do. So enjoy the summer, right? Just an idea. <laughs> no, it is. It's, it's no, it's a great idea. idea. These are all outstanding. This is where things start to take place. Um, we do have a need for an executive session and trying to comply with the statutory requirement. Um, we need to move uh, into an executive session if the board should determine to discuss uh, a contract matter uh, because the premature uh, disclosure discussion would uh, uh, basically put the parties at substantial disadvantage. Um, so could I actually get a motion uh, relative to that? Move to find that the general public uh, should not be participating in this next discussion. I move that we go into executive session based upon the rationale that you provided. Okay. Second. Okay. Um, so uh, is there any discussion? So we'll, we will go in because we're going into executive session. We will then come out of this executive session to uh, adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much. Um, we need a few more there signatures. There's there three each in these There's three. Oh, I only got two. Be any this is really just to inform them.